Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. In today's video, I had the opportunity to interview Chair and Professor of Mechanical Engineering at University of Western Ontario, Professor Anthony Stratman. Professor Stratman has a bachelor's, master's, and PhD in mechanical engineering and has been teaching engineering courses for over 20 years. He was one of my favorite professors at Western and is someone who truly respects the balance between you know, social life, studies, as well as extracurriculars. If you guys like this interview, I'd really appreciate you liking this video and subscribing to the channel to see more videos just like this. In this interview, we talk about some of the traits that kind of separate those who do well in engineering from those who don't. We also talk about how important time management is, as well as becoming interested in the course you're learning. All that and more is coming up right after this. Okay, so today we have Professor Stratman, who's part of the Mechanical and Materials Engineering Program at Western University. Thanks a ton for being on the show. Oh, thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Um, if you could just give us some background on kind of, you know, your academic career, both as like an instructor and as a student, I think that'd be pretty helpful. Okay, well, as a student, I mean, I, I started a little bit late into engineering. I, I actually graduated from, from high school, basically knowing that I wanted to be a machinist. Mm. which is somehow connected to our industry, but it was, uh, it was just kind of the, you know, the way I grew up on a farm in, in rural Ontario and, and my father was a carpenter and trades were a big thing. So I, I went to a community college and I got a, a diploma, a technician's diploma in manufacturing engineering, which basically set me up to be a machinist. And I finished the program and I, I got my first job in a machine shop and I was, actually contemplating going for the apprenticeship route in that. And then something changed after about four months and I, I switched jobs and I worked in a different job where I had some exposure to engineering. Mm. And that's when I really sort of thought that I might be in the wrong field. I, I was really interested in the people who were in charge of the processes and in charge of the design work more so than just kind of the I wouldn't say the blue collar, but more of the, of the really detailed floor level activities that technicians did. Right. So um, I, I applied to go to Western University to do an undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering at that point. And I was just really keen to become a designer. Mm. And uh, so I, I went to Western. I was thrilled. I, I went through first year. And after first year, I went in mechanical engineering without a second thought. But second year engineering something changed again all the, the thought that I wanted to be a mechanical designer it was all about you know gearboxes and engines and structures and things and I got introduced to the wet side of, of mechanical engineering and thermal fluids and I just I didn't realize it was part of mechanical engineering and I just got so engaged in it that I you know these were the courses I thrived in and that became my attention for most of the rest of my degree and then um, I kind of followed my notes. This is what I tell my kids and my, and my students that when I was an undergraduate student, I did what I thought was interesting. So with the exception of taking psychology courses, which I, I regretted at the time because I didn't find them very interesting, but everything about engineering was completely interesting to me. So, um, fourth year came along and I was urged to apply for a graduate scholarship. I didn't even know what graduate school really was, but... I, you know, they basically came into the class, the chair of the department and said, if you've got, you know, an A average or above, I want you to apply for scholarships to come to graduate school. So my, my best friend and I, we both applied, we both got scholarships and we went to graduate school for no other reason than we just, you know, we were good <laughs> students and we, we, we were going to get paid to go. So we yeah, that's great. And I really enjoyed doing my master's at Western with, with, uh, a professor that I really respected and it got me thinking about doing a PhD but not for the purpose of becoming an academic it was just because I really enjoyed the research work and, and right. the, you know the the detailed work I was able to do so I applied for another scholarship I applied to do a PhD program and I went to the University of Waterloo for that um, but again when I finished my PhD work I didn't apply for a single faculty position. I was at that point, I was really ready to go back into industry. I mean, I'd right. been in university for almost nine years at that point. 
And I, I had a job. Basically, I, I left. I defended my PhD and I started work five days later at a, at a software company. And uh, yeah, I had, I had no interest whatsoever in becoming an academic at that point. Two years down the road, I get a call from, from the, the chair of mechanical engineering at Western that there are faculty positions open. And he was really keen to develop a program in computational fluid dynamics, which is what I did my PhD right. in. And it just so happened that I did my PhD with somebody who was, who was really internationally respected in that field. And I mean, it was, I guess, through some luck and some good choice that I maybe I didn't even realize at the time, but um, it, it got me, I was thinking at that point, you know what, I've only been working for two years as kind of a software developer. Right. And uh, I thought, why not? I yeah. thought give it a shot. So I applied for a couple of positions and Western offered me a job. And, and basically I, I started and I never looked back. It became right. kind of the new passion was I never, I never saw myself as a teacher. And I think that's the part that when I was doing my research work as a graduate student, it, it never made me think that I should become an academic because that's such a big part of being an academic. Right, of course. So, so that's kind of the story. I mean, I, I yeah. in some way I followed no, my nose all the way through. <laughs> I just, I yeah. ended up here. It wasn't like this was my destination from when I was, you know, wrote my book report in grade six. And, yeah, right. Uh, no, it's interesting. And it's funny that you started kind of on more of the practical side uh, as like a technician, right? And then went to the engineering and more like theoretical side because I think like people's sentiment towards engineering is like that you could like help out on like an engine problem or something like that like you could approach like a broken down car and solve it like at least that's what my dad is always like he's like what do you mean you can't fix this like you're an engineer and I'm like man like, I know math pretty well but that's about it like, <laughs> yeah exactly so, so it's funny that you kind of went the other way so you know maybe you could help out with a, with a car engine or something but uh no that, that's really helpful and you know I kind of want to dive into you know, you've seen, obviously, you've had a long career at Western, um, both as like a student and as now an instructor. What do you think that like separates people from doing well in engineering and those that don't do as well as in engineering? Like, you know, do you look at like the intelligence? Do you look at hard work? Do you look at like their work ethic or, you know, strategies to help them get through that time? Like, what, what are your thoughts on that? So I think one of the things we've seen in engineering uh, I've, I've been there almost 25 years now. One of the things we've really noticed from two decades ago is that a lot of students take engineering because it's a good degree to have, as opposed to because they want to be engineers, right? I mean, a lot of people uh, do engineering with business with the expectation that they're going to function in business, not ever design anything. But right. being an engineer is kind of a unique, it teaches you a lot about problem solving. It teaches you a lot about time management, um, but it's, I think in, in terms of students coming in to do well, there's kind of two schools of that. There's the students that are, that are really bright and that are using it as a stepping stone to do something else like business or, or economics or law. Right. And then there's the group that's just really keen to become an engineer. Right. And then there's a group in between that you can tell they, they're not sure why they're there. They're there because their right. uncle was an engineer or because their parents said this is a good thing to do. And they, they tend to flounder a little bit. So um, I think engineering, I don't think it's, it's that hard to do well if you're, if you're committed to doing the work. Yeah. And I, I've actually been told this by some students who who did engineering with medicine. This is a degree we used to have. So they, they would take engineering at the same time as they would become medical. Doctors. <laughs> That's wild. And they, they characterize engineering as, and these are bright people, obviously, otherwise they wouldn't yeah, get into sure. med school, but they characterize engineering as a place where if you did the work, it was easy to get very high marks because you learned how to do something and then you applied it in different right. places. But they were very good at learning things so they could get 90 plus in everything. Whereas in medical school, doing well depended a lot on how good your memory was because right. you had to read books and remember everything. Right. It wasn't mathematical. Like it wasn't, it wasn't learning necessarily how to do something and then be able to, to do it over and over. So I think that to be able to do well in engineering, if, if you're really committed to becoming an engineer, 
Um, I mean, there's obviously you have to be able to do the math and the physics and the chemistry and stuff, but I find that the people who are driven to do it, um, they rarely fail. I mean, they, they come to university because they're already pretty good at that. To get in, you pretty much have to have an A average in your, yeah, in your right. high school credit. So I don't think that there's too many people that, that do really, really badly in engineering because they come in and try really, really hard and just don't get it. It's yeah. mostly that they, for some reason, they don't ever get engaged enough in it to do the work to get through. So I, th I think the most important thing is just the engagement and, and the commitment to wanting to become an engineer. No, that's, that's honestly like great to hear. And it's, I think it'd probably be pretty hopeful for a lot of students that are wanting to go into engineering, but you know, are scared because like the sentiment towards it is pretty aggressive. You know, everyone's like, oh, you're going into engineering. Like, whoa, like that's crazy. And then, you know, they had kind of built it up to be this kind of scary uh, program to go into. And I definitely felt like that going into engineering and, coming out of it, I felt like, you know, I'm really grateful for having that experience because it was hard, but it did show you that like any problem can be solved. It might just take you a little bit longer to figure it out. Um, so I'm wondering, like, you know, you talked about that interest part of, of engineering. And I think there's obviously like a correlation with how, like the grade you get in the course and how interested you are in it, right? Whether that comes down to you're interested in it. So then you work harder in it. So you get a better mark and maybe an indirect effect, but I think that's pretty important. So if students are struggling with like, I guess, fostering that interest or the teacher's not really doing it for them, what would you say they could do to, I guess, benefit themselves and make themselves more interested in the course? Yeah, that's, that's a tricky one because I always, as I said, my, I, I kind of mentor people, instructors, right. that, you know, a really bright student is going to do well despite what you do however good or bad you, you pass the material, if they know what they have to learn, they're going to find a way to do it. Uh, an average or poor student, they need some guidance through the process. And that's where, you know, a really good instructor is somebody who takes uh, students who are otherwise not necessarily interested in the topic or maybe even afraid of the topic because they've heard it's hard right. and really turns them around, like gets them engaged to the point where they, they develop some confidence in the topic and they become interested in it and it becomes, you know, it becomes maybe not their favorite thing, but at least it's at a comfort level where they can, they For feel sure. like they can, they can actually do work with it. Uh, I would say if, if somebody is really struggling with a particular topic, finding a network of students who are maybe a little more engaged in the topic might help. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I don't underestimate the amount of, you know, the impact that having a good um, friend group or a good, you know, network around you can, can have. And I remember when I, when I was going through as an undergraduate student, that formed when I was in second year. And, and my friend group was, you know, a little bit competitive. We were, we were kind of on the higher end of the class, but we were, you know, we were a little bit competitive in yeah. all of our courses. And that, that friendly competition is, is something that really, helps you to be engaged in everything. For sure. And I think also like the, uh, it, it makes studying so much more effective when you can like talk something out with someone and actually like grasp the top topic. Like I've been like tutoring some students recently and you know, in like math and physics. And I was realizing like while I was doing, it, I was like, when you start to teach something to someone, like you grasp it so much faster than you would if you were just trying to like passively learn it. So I think that's probably an underrated tool that people don't, you know, utilize enough is like, all right, if someone missed a lecture or like one of your buddies or something like that, like try and teach it to him because you'll probably get more out of it than he will, but that's a still a very effective way to study. Yeah, that, no, that's a really good point. And I think the other thing that's happening now is that um, because of this year of pandemic where a lot of things yeah. are online, there's actually a lot of information available on YouTube. And, and this was available before too. I mean, I know that, um, and I, I learned about this when, when Brian, my son was going through, he the the I think it was engineering explained was there was somebody oh, that I don't know if I know that one lots of videos I think the guy's name is Patrick and uh, he he just has explanations about lots of things but when you when you when you look up engineering explained you also get lots and lots of other information you right. can literally just tap in that you're struggling you know in some algebra problem completing the square and you can find. Yeah, right. videos of different people explaining how to do it and why you do it so i think 
that's probably a pretty powerful avenue for modern students to get oh, extra help outside of the class to try and get a little more engaged. I, my recommendation though would, would really be, you know, kind of what you said, where you, you network with your friends and right. you, you explain something to somebody else so that you hear yourself out loud. Yeah. Try, trying to articulate what, right. what you're <laughs> supposed to know. Right, of course. Yeah. And it, like they have that like a uh, sign on the wall or like at Western, like saying like engineering is like a team sport. And it's honestly like so true. Like, you know, you, your buddy, you or your buddy miss a class, like you fill in with for, for each other, like projects, assignments, like you kind of help each other out to understand what's going on. And I think that's like a really powerful uh, tool that maybe isn't as apparent in other degrees, just because engineering is so structured and like you're always taking the same classes as everyone. So it's something that definitely should be utilized and, uh, you know, explored for people. And uh, yeah, that, that, you know, a point on YouTube and that being like a new, like, I guess, learning tool is really powerful. I think, you know, getting people to consume more educational content, content through like different mediums. So, you know, if you go to a lecture and you get taught it, like that's one method, then you look at the textbook, like that's a second method. You explain it to a friend, that's a third method. And then, you know, finally finding a new video or a new lecture, that's like now you have five different ways to kind of consume the same material. And I think coming at it from all the different angles is actually going to be, you know, it's going to increase your retention, but it's also probably more effective and faster um, than you just doing the same, you know, rote memory style of just trying to look at one medium the entire time. Yeah. And, you know, the, the interesting thing, too, is that I, I heard this explained by a former provost that, um, you know, we we still tend, you know, in our in the way we lecture material we're lecturing very similar material that we did 20, 30, 40 years ago because the laws of physics haven't changed, right? So yeah. I mean, we still plot along and we have to ensure that people know how to do things before they leave. But the modern currency, it, when I was going through university, the, the, the kind of academic currency was what you could put in your head, what right. you can remember in courses. And when you went to the, you know, when you were doing calculations, we didn't have laptops and and, and you know smartphones so we had to know we had our textbooks but we had to basically know we remembered a lot of things right the modern academic currency is not how much you can stuff in your head but it's how to, to know where to go to get information because you're walking around with a, with a computer in your hand yeah. everybody has a laptop access to the internet so you know making use of these tools while you're a student is probably a really good way to set yourself up for practice as well. For sure. Yeah, in terms of, uh, I guess, like learning or a more traditional study habits, you know, um, are, are you more of a proponent of like going through theory or practice problems? I guess like obviously it's always gonna be a combination of both, um, but how do you find students get the best and, you know, can learn the most effectively uh, through different forms of mediums? Well, I, like I said, I think the, the most important objective in a course is that a student is able to do problems in that area and have some confidence with the outcome. So to, to you know, get an appreciation for, if, if you're doing mechanics and materials, getting an appreciation for how far something bends when you put a force on it and, you know, how many, you know, how many kilonewtons is not very much and how many kilonewtons is, is a lot. And, you know, just just some appreciation for the for the magnitudes of certain things, and then if when it comes to you know thermal fluids, how much does a does a cubic meter of air weigh and a cubic meter of water, and an appreciation for what a kilojoule is and a megajoule, right. and because too often you see very strange answers with no <laughs> rationale. They have no no concept that you know ten megajoules is a lot. Yeah, but they just they write it down and and, and it's off by three orders of magnitude, but they don't, they don't know. So to me, you know, we, we have to spend our time teaching students where things come from, but the objective in the course is not to turn everybody into a theoretician. The very brightest students are going to remember the theory and they're probably going to really enjoy that part. But, you know, the average student, the person who's going to get 70 or between 60 and 70 say, they have to be able to solve problems. At yeah. least they have to be able to solve the kinds of problems that you showed them how to solve. They may not be able to extrapolate very far outside of that box you, you work them in, but uh, they have to be able to solve problems. So when it comes to study, 
a measure of whether you're, you know, in a good place in a given course is if you can independently solve the problems that are being assigned, or at least right. if you're becoming more and more independent as you go. Right. And we, we, I mean, we've kind of instituted years ago this notion of, you know, we use our tutorial sessions for kind of Q&A and then group exercises, wide open group exercises, because I don't like quizzes. Right. I find that I find that students are are over assessed. You know, people are running quizzes and they're running exams and they're running, you know, all kinds of this independent assessment right. yeah, and yeah. students get really stressed out by this. And that's really not the way life is. You know, when you're, when you're working and you're an engineer, you're always going to be bouncing things off other people. So I find that learning how to do problems in small groups in the tutorial and just giving a participation grade for being there right. and actually putting some things down on paper and, and talking your way through problems, students get more mileage out of that than saying I'm having another quiz for 2% because then <laughs> everybody spends the night before studying. They skip all the lectures that day. They yeah. sit, you know, all sweating in, in the class for 2% of the mark. And it's just, so we're, we're really trying to move kind of to a different, uh, you know, a different paradigm of, of assessment where we're not, where life isn't about one continuous assessment in engineering school. So that, yeah. you know, lessen the amount of graded homework, less than the number of, of uh, you know, in tutorial or in-class quizzes and just really focus on, on the student's ability to, to get, you know, gain certain objectives. No, that makes total sense. And yeah, like it's funny thinking about like uh, what you talked about before about like the mega jewels and stuff like that. And, you know, honestly, like if I was going to talk about that, I probably wouldn't understand what actually is a lot. And I, I maybe have some, you know, better than like a first year engineering student or something, but I feel like I, I wouldn't really have that appreciation, but it's easy to uh, to find some problems in your answers and kind of circle back when you actually have that experience or you have like, you know, you can understand that like uh, a mega jewel is like, you know, hundreds of pounds of TNT or whatever it would be, right? And so mm -hmm. then you could actually kind of understand like, would this problem actually cause that? So that's a, that's an interesting way to, to go about it. And yeah, like the, the testing and the exams, I think, you know, are, are, are super stressful going through engineering, like obviously 50% final exams and, you know, understanding that you need to pass the final exam to pass the course. Like there are a lot of these things that I definitely think caused me to like skip lectures back then. And, you know, here you say that the group, group collaboration will definitely, you know, win in the long run in terms of like your retention. So that's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about like making notes in engineering. So I kind of had some experience when I was going through it where I like, would try and make some beautiful, like pretty looking notes and stuff like that. And I kind of realized quickly that how stupid that was and how ineffective that was to actually like learning the material, especially like reading the textbook and making notes. I found you can get good at that. And I think it's a really good skill to be good at utilizing the textbook. But when I was trying to do it, I was like going through it, you know, reading it from chapter to chapter, like front to back and like trying to make notes on that. And I'm realizing now that like, you know, the textbook isn't a novel. You shouldn't really read it as a novel. You should yeah. go in with a goal, try to get the material and the information you need and then come out. Like it shouldn't be this kind of burst mentality of like read the whole chapter and see if you retain it. Cause I don't think it's really effective. That's, that's a really good point. I mean, definitely the, the textbook is kind of a, a guide in the yeah. course, right? It's, it's a, uh, it's that, that book that stays on your shelf that has all the information as long as you know where to look for it. Um, Taking notes, I mean, you know from taking my course that I was always an advocate that students take their own notes. Yeah. And, but I mean, over the last 10 years or so with, with people, everybody walks into class with a camera in their hand, high definition camera on their smartphone. Right. So I, I've been telling people for years now, if you'd rather just listen to me, just wait till I fill the board and take a picture. I don't care. Like if that, if that works better for you and this year, because of the online versions of the course, I actually, every video, um, I, I, give, I give a week's worth of notes along with, you know, a series of short videos and the notes are complete. And basically it's, it's every whiteboard I fill up is, is one page of notes. And so I post that and then I say, you know what, watch 
watch the videos with the notes beside you and then you can just highlight and circle and do your thing. But some students are still, they still, they learn more from writing it down themselves. And I remember that's the way I learned too. If I, if I want to really put something up here, yeah. if I write it down, it's, I don't know what it is. It's, there's some physiology and psychology in right. that where, you know, reading is, is one level, but writing, you know, your sure. brain is telling your hand to do, yeah, you know, yeah, so you're true. really, things you write, you do tend to remember better. And, and a lot of students, they actually enjoy sitting in class, taking their own notes. Uh, they don't, I mean, they'll download yours if you post them, but, but for the most part, the students that take their own notes and are honest about it, they still do the best. Yeah. Right? And it's, yeah, I, 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 but I think, like I'm against note taking by any means. I was just more against like the the busy work note taking where you're like making things look nice. You're like writing it down the whole sentence, even though you probably don't need to write down the whole sentence just because it like looks nicer. You know, it's kind of like that like organization OCD that starts to happen. Where I, I do think, you know, if they were to look at your notes, take a picture of them and then work through them themselves, I think that would be like extremely powerful because again, you're you're getting the benefits of writing it down and you know remembering it but also you're like working through the problem like i think the passive note taking of reading something on a slide and writing exactly what was written down doesn't really probably doesn't have as much of an effect as like you taking that material and trying to distill it or trying to condense it because that's a lot more like active in, in my opinion i don't know if that makes sense it does and and what what i always liked about about um you know professors who wrote things down and spoke to them is right. that it was a way of of kind of tempering the speed of your lecture because if if people came in with a stack of slides i mean when i was when i was an undergrad it was overheads right they yeah. pour on them and but they would go through way too much you couldn't hardly keep up with with everything that was going on even if they gave you notes it was a real struggle to keep up yeah but if, if the prof writes, then it paces them through lectures. Because if, if you're gonna, if, if students want to take notes, then you have to deliver things at a pace where they can keep notes and, and listen at the same time. Right. You don't wanna be mowing through three lectures worth of material in one day because it just, it doesn't work. Because then all they do is write and they don't hear you. Yeah. So in a lot of ways, this year might have resolved a bit of that because now we're going to have videos galore for all of our courses. So even if somebody, you know, misses two or three of my lectures or, or, you know, doesn't understand something about entropy or whatever it happens to be, they can literally just go online and dig up the video where I did that yeah. and watch it five times until they yeah, for sure. get it right. And I think that that's actually going to be a really, really big help for next year. But um, no, I think, you know, the, the way students learn in some way, I think it's a personal thing. Mm -hmm. Some people like the, you know, the colorful notes with the highlighting yeah, all right, the place right. and other people's notes are almost, you know, unreadable. Yeah. <laughs> but they still somehow get it. No, that's a good point. Yeah, it definitely is personal. I think, you know, like I, I think I'm more uh, like you to the, the point where you write something down to like understand it or to remember it. But I think I was like expecting myself to make these notes and then like come back to it and read those exact notes when I honestly think like if I just come back to it and try and condense those notes down, that would be better than me rereading what I already wrote down and kind yeah. of going through it that way. But, mm -hmm. but yeah, and we also talked about a little bit about, uh, you know, teaching and I was, I definitely noticed this, you know, from teaching just like grade 11, grade 12 and like a little bit of university physics, but uh, going back and teaching someone something that's like from a course you've taken, taken before and you're not really doing anymore can still show you a lot of uh, things that you guys maybe didn't pick up on the first time. So like you'll notice if you go through like grade 11 functions or like grade 10, like quadratics, you're like, wow, I didn't really have the appreciation for this that I did even when I was using this material all through my four years of engineering. Whereas now I can like look at it and I'm like, oh, I actually like caught something the second and the third and the fourth time. So I think there should be kind of more of a... Um, a push to like relearn. And I, I don't think that's like you necessarily going backwards. Cause I find a lot of the time you'll, you'll end up uncovering something you never saw before. Yeah. That, that's interesting because I, but I, I mean, you're looking at the material kind of through a different lens mm -hmm. in that now you've got all the experience of taking advanced courses in math and physics that's a good point, and, yeah. and applied physics. 
And I think that's where it really, really changes. And now you look backwards at the math and it's a lot easier to say, yeah, you have to learn that. Yeah, because, and, and the way I liken it is that, and I, and I hear this all the time from, from students, they complain that wow, we take so much math. And then I hear from faculty members that say, you know, they take all this math. So I have to fill my course with math because otherwise they feel like they don't, it, it's all of it's worthless that they took. And I always kind of liken, you know, learning things like math to, to something like learning the alphabet where the goal of learning the alphabet is not so that you can keep writing letters when you're 40 years old, like A, B, C. Right. It's so that you learn, you learn the letters so that you can learn words. And then you learn words so that you can fit them together into sentences. And then the sentences become paragraphs. And ultimately, right, right, right. you read and write fluently. But you never go back and go A, B, C. You don't need to. So mm -hmm. it, it's a means to an end. And math is kind of the same thing where... You learn algebra, you learn functions, you know, you learn elements of calculus, but you learn it so that you can learn applied physics because yeah. this is the way stuff is pitched to you. And it doesn't matter whether you're taking mechanics or fluid mechanics or, you know, some advanced topic, there's some element of mathematics and we don't have to keep testing whether you can solve some second order differential equation. At some right. point, it's good enough that you just recognize what it is. Right. And you know where the solution is. You know that there's a general solution for it. But to me, you know, once you're, you're doing heat transfer problems and you're doing mechanics, probably kinematics and whatever, the calculus is all embedded in it, just right. like the alphabet is embedded in every book you read. Right. And this is the way I try and explain it to, you know, to students. And also even, I'll never forget, I had this, this old fellow at one of our uh, homecoming days. And he came up to me and he said, and he said, you know what? I think I've put every single subject to use except for calculus. <laughs> and I kind of laughed and I said, if you've put every other subject to use, then you've probably done more with calculus than yeah, with almost sure. any other thing you've done because you yeah. wouldn't have learned those other things without your understanding of math. Yeah. No, absolutely. It's so funny, like looking back on it and having a little bit more of like, I guess, wisdom or experience, whatever you want to call it. But I remember being in grade 11 and being like, when am I going to use like trigonometry? Like knowing I was going to go into engineering. And then I was like, I used it every single day of my yeah. four year career. Well, like, <laughs> and that's the other thing is that you can't, you, you, you'll you never use what you don't know about. Right. So, so I mean, we have to keep pitching new things and some of them you'll use and some of them you won't. But if nobody ever showed you that there was such a thing as a hammer, You'd be trying to hit nails in with a bat, you know. Yeah, or, yeah. You know, it's you just you have to be shown what's there, and at, like statistics is another great example. Right. You know, you learn you learn very very basic statistics probably in grade eleven or twelve. You know, the mean, the mode, and all that stuff. But and you can probably get through your life with only learn, with only knowing some basic things. But if somebody if you take a course in advanced stats then you really learn some tools that are gonna help you in certain areas, Definitely. right? In business and engineering and experimentation and psychology and everything. But if somebody hadn't showed you that, you would not likely come up with it yourself. Right, absolutely. So it's, it, it's like having a toolkit. And I know Professor Savory, he, he actually created this academic toolkit where every time the class learns something, he writes it on a piece of paper and puts it in this toolbox <laughs> he has, which is kind of funny, but in a lot of ways, it's, it's, it's interesting because it, we think the same. Yeah. It's about, you know, you're not going to come up with everything yourself. So we have to show you some stuff. Yeah. And then, you know, the stuff you really need, you'll use, or you'll remember that you had it and, and you'll put it to use. Yeah. No, I think math is definitely, if, if somebody, you know, if you're building a shed, you're going to, if you understand trigonometry and you understand Pythagorean theorem, your shed's going to look better than some right, of course. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. You're like, you don't know what you don't know. That kind of, that kind of saying. Yep. Um, lastly, I, I want to touch on kind of, we talked about a bit, but like time management, you know, how does students, obviously engineering and honestly any university program, um, it's tough. And like time management and organization are probably some of the best skills you learn and get good at throughout that time. Um, and I know you'd be a proponent of like, you know, uh, balancing like a social life, you know, having extracurriculars, uh, as well as like academics. What do you think some of the best strategies are to kind of 
plan out or um, best allocate their time, you know, to meet that, to the, meet the demands of like an engineering schedule and also wanting to have like a social life. Yeah, I, th I think what happens in engineering, as you probably know, is that your social life becomes your network of friends that you mostly meet in engineering. Yeah. And your old friends are the ones that you see at Thanksgiving when you go home and at Christmas when you go home. And you kind of, it, I, I think it, it's really hard in a, in a subject like that. And, and there's lots of other things, law and med any kind of professional degree. I think that you get so, there, there's more work to do than you can finish. Right. And, and that's where you said like time management becomes critical because not only do you have to manage your time, but you have to be able to decipher what's important, like what's critical yeah, to do and what can kind of sit. And you have to be able to plan, you know, plan for your exam timetable weeks before it happens. Because yeah. if, you, if you don't, if you don't start until the first day of exams, you're already two weeks behind. Right. Yeah, so I, mean, absolutely. I, I just, you know, engineering is, is a, is a tricky one. And, and like I said, I think that in, in year one, I don't think students are very good at managing their time in no, general. Definitely. Yeah. As they get a little farther along, um, I'm not sure if I could tell you a specific strategy for how to do it. I mean, we, we I just try and mentor students into, you know, trying to, you know, create create a, a, like a weekly activity where you, you look at the week and then you kind of plan out how many hours you have to spend to solve your mechanics homework and to solve, you know, yeah. your thermodynamics homework and whatever, and that you, when the time comes, you spend the time and you also factor in times when you're not going to work. Right. Right. I mean, this, I think that's probably the only way you'll ever have free time is if you schedule it in, because like I said, there's more work than you can finish. Right. Of course. You could work all the time. And, yeah. and literally that doesn't change in your life. Right. I mean, yeah. you think university is the hardest thing you ever did. Well, wait till you go to work. And right. then, then sure. the stresses are different. And so you, you really have to get good at, at scheduling free time. I, th I think it makes, it probably makes you a better student, even though you may not get every single last thing done. Right. Yeah. But you won't be so compulsive either that, that, you know, you always have to be working and um, yeah. you, you have to have some time to kind of decompress and, and have a beer with your buddies. And, For sure. Yeah. No, that sounds great. And I just want to, you know, thank you so much for the time and helping out. I hopefully, you know, some people find this valuable. I've definitely thought it was super interesting to kind of talk to a, a former professor and, and look back on engineering, uh, like what we did learn and, you know, those kind of things that you can take on uh, with you as you go about life. So, so thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. It was a pleasure. So I hope you guys found that conversation as interesting as I did. If you did, I'd really appreciate you liking the video and subscribing to the channel to see more of the interviews just like this. Thanks for taking the time to watch this video and I'll see you guys in the next one.